Good evening, my friends. My name is Adam, and I will be your host on A Haunted History, the podcast that will lead you on a spine-tingling journey through the shadowy corridors of the past. From the eerie echoes of ancient castles to the whispered secrets of forgotten battlefields, each episode will transport you to a different era where history and the supernatural collide. So dim the lights, my friends, and gather around as we prepare to embark on a historical adventure beyond the veil. Welcome again to A Haunted History. Halloween. To some it's candy, costumes, scary decorations. Maybe you binge watch scary movies. To each person, they celebrate it in their own way. But what is Halloween? How did it get started? And what is the history behind some of the very traditions that we continue today? On this episode of A Haunted History, we will look into the past to shed light on these very questions. Now, it's widely believed that the Halloween traditions originated with the ancient Celtic Harvest Festival, particularly the Gaelic Festival of Samhain, which would be the Celtic New Year. Now, Samhain was also the Lord of Death. His name literally meant summer's end. So this was celebrating the end of the harvest season and the coming of winter or the darker times of the year. This time of year would have been halfway between autumn, the, the autumn equinox, and the winter solstice, October 31st. Now this was seen as a time where the boundaries uh, between this world and the spirit world or the other world were lifted, allowing spirits to more easily come and go freely into our world. So this would have been a time that the Celts were particularly wary of, um, so much so that they wore costumes and had certain traditions that they kept up to make sure that they weren't transported back to the other world by evil spirits. The costumes they wore would have typically been of um, maybe a bear skin, wolf skin, they tried to look like they were already dead or that they were already spirits. That way, the spirits that were among them wouldn't think that they were a living person and wouldn't think to transport them back into the other world. Another practice they had was the lighting of a sacred bonfire by the Druid High Priests. This was done with a sacred oak tree. So they would take these branches and they would light it and they would commit sacrifices, either human animal, uh, sometimes just vegetable. And then the inhabitants of the village were ordered to put out the fires in their own home and then take a torch from the sacred fire and relight their own fires in their own homes for protection. So that was like two of the major things they did. They also had uh, fortune telling um, to predict the harvest of the next year. Uh, activities of that nature, um, and then plus, of course, a feast. So this moves on to All Saints Day and the Catholic Church, and kind of where we get our current ideas and traditions for Halloween. Now, the Catholic Church has long denied moving All Saints Day from May 13th to November 1st in order to attract pagans observing the spirit world around the same time. But to me, that seems much like a coincidence. The church has always claimed that the move was made uh, to mark a papal dedication of a certain church that was honoring the saints. Either way, in 731 AD, Pope Gregory III designated November 1st as a time to honor the saints. Now, the church has denied that this was their original intention, but it led to the night before All Saints Day becoming known as All Hallows Eve. Um, the reason for this name was um, hallows means holy, and the saints were considered holy. In time, it actually picked up a lot of the Celtic traditions, again, coincidence, um, and later was known as Halloween. Now, there is a popular belief that has been held by some and portrayed by the media and in movies that Halloween is a satanic holiday. It is not. It couldn't be further from the truth, and there is no 
uh, reported connection between Satan and Halloween. Even the Church of Satan um, has come out saying that they do not view this as a religious holiday, but as a secular one, much like Americans uh, celebrating the 4th of July. This belief in a connection to Satanism was pushed by the media um, in the 1980s. In fact, it was so misleading, it led to what became known as the Satanic Panic of the 1980s. But most of those rituals that they focused on were largely debunked at the time. But it did scare a lot of people at the time. So the connection between something evil it's not really there, but it is a belief held by some still, um, even though it, it has been debunked. Now, next is the, the origins of trick-or-treating. Now, trick-or-treating began to appear during the Middle Ages, actually. It was actually called guising, from the word disguise. Children would dress up in costume and go door-to-door -door on what they called hollow mass, asking for food or money in terms uh, in turn, they would offer uh, prayers or a song for the dead. This was called souling, and the kids were known as solers. A few the theories suggest that the practice made its way to American soil around the turn of the 1900s, but it had given away to more tricks by youth versus singing for the dead. And during the Great Depression, the, the pranks were known to get rather violent. Uh, many communities started offering up treats um, in order to curb the violent behavior. The commercialization of Halloween really started at the end of World War II uh, with uh, the end of sugar rationing. And it was really pushed by the candy companies. As far as the evolution of costumes worn by children, uh, especially in the um, early 1900s, uh, most of them were handmade. And if you've ever seen any pictures of these things, they are freaky beyond belief. Um, burlap sacks with holes poked in them. I mean, just these homemade costumes, I mean, would send a shiver down my, my spine. Reminds me of some of the, the horror movies like The Hills Have Eyes and things of that you see today. I mean, just creepy. But it was around the 1930s that uh, companies saw the popularity of trick-or-treating as it started to take off, and they started mass-producing costumes for sales in stores. So that did, that did come about. Now, honestly, my wife even asked me about this the other night. She brought up Devil's Night, and she said, well, isn't Halloween known as Devil's Night? Well, it, that's actually wrong as well. Uh, Devil's Night actually takes place on the 30th, not the 31st, and has nothing to do with Satan, but everything has to do, but has everything to do with youth and pranks. Most were lower level, like throwing eggs, toilet paper, etc. Um, instead, some areas led to crimes of vandalism, like smashing windows, in cities like Detroit, and each area had their own way of mischief. And um, it is also important to note that Devil's Night is also known as Mischief Night. But in cities like Detroit that had had an economic downturn, um, a lot of buildings were left vacant. And because of a, there were a lot of buildings left vacant, arson began to arise as one of the hallmarks in major cities um, on Devil's Night. This actually peaked around 1990 in Detroit, and there was a call to action that centered on community involvement and patrols to curve the vandalism and make it um, more friendly. And they, the, the mayor even asked the media to stop referring to it as Devil's Night because he thought that that's also a trigger phrase that would um, cause the youth to then act out. Now, I want to talk about carving pumpkins. And everybody's got memories of scooping handfuls of goop and pumpkin seeds out of a lot large orange gourds before carving a face and sticking a candle inside and placing it on your front porch. 
to some it's great fun, to some it's frustrating, to some your parents did it for you because you couldn't do it yourself. But what is the story behind this tradition? Now, the origin of jack-o'-lantern takes a few different forms. But my favorite theory is from an old Irish tale about a man named Stingy Jack. And Stingy Jack loved to play tricks on people. He even managed to play a trick on the devil. And this is where our story begins. Jack is said to have offered up his soul to the devil for retrieving an apple from an apple tree. The devil, thinking he had struck gold because this is one of the easiest souls he's ever collected, complied and climbed the tree to retrieve the apple. Once up the tree, Jack actually drew the sign of the cross on the tree, thus trapping the devil. Now, the devil pleaded with Jack and said that he would not collect on his immortal soul if Jack would erase the mark and let him down. Jack complied. He had had his fun. So he, he erased the mark and thought he had won. Devil came down. Devil disappeared. So in this version of the story, years later, Jack, Jack gets old, Jack dies. So Jack was such a jerk that heaven didn't want him because of all of his mischievous deeds throughout the village and just his life in general. And hell had made a promise that they wouldn't collect on him, so he couldn't go to hell either. He was trapped between both worlds as a ghost. Whether it was out of animosity or respect, the devil gave him, is said to have given him, a ember of coal from hell's fire in which he placed in a hollowed-out turnip, which happened to be one of Jack's favorite foods, to light his way as he wandered the afterlife here on Earth. Now, the Irish have always carved the turnips and set them out to ward away evil. When they immigrated to America, it said that they started ca carving pumpkins because there were more pumpkins available and they were larger and easier to carve. It was just easier to get. But regardless, the reason behind carving of this nature and placing the candle is to ward off evil spirits, especially that of Jack himself, so that he will not cause mischief for your home, and he will thus leave it alone. Now, I myself um, have a pop cultural opinion on this. And this actually goes to the Simpson Treehouse of Horrors number five, aired in 1993. Now, there are some similarities I'm going to point out, um, but there's never been anything um, from the Simpsons writing staff or anything I could find that stated that these two stories are correlated. This is just my own opinion. Homer trades his soul for a donut. After realizing that by not finishing the donut, that his contract by the devil is not fulfilled and the devil cannot collect on his soul, he starts chanting that he's smarter than the devil. The devil gets angry. The devil disappears. Homer later finishes the donut. So what comes to mind is him thinking he's smarter than the devil. By him finishing the donut... That's that's kind of where the, the similarities end on this. Um, so he finishes the donut, and the devil comes back, wants to collect on his soul. They commit to doing a trial, and it's found that he had already pledged his soul to his wife, and the devil could not collect on it. So in that way, it is similar. However, at the end of it, the devil, which is played by Ned Flanders, actually placed a donut on Homer's head, made his head into a donut. So he said, as punishment, I will place that ill-gotten donut upon your head. So in a way, he's cursing him. Homer thought he beat the devil. So that's where that kind of came into mind, in my mind. So, I mean, it's completely my... Uh, my take on things, but I, I really do think that that's, uh, you know, a, a little bit of uh, sneaky pop culture. And, you know, at the time, I think Conan O'Brien was writing for uh, The Simpsons. And uh, I know that uh, he's Irish, so um, I don't know. But, uh, you know, maybe maybe he threw that little hat into the ring as kind of a, 
is kind of a way to make it kind of fun. So, you know, I'm, I'm completely at a loss for that, but I do think that, you know, that might be, I mean, that's what I saw. So that's what I'm sharing on that. So, um, yeah, these, these are just a few, um, just tidbits on Halloween, uh, just to go back and, and reiterate, um, how it got started, why we wear the costumes we do today, why they wore them back then, and why we carve pumpkins, why we, and the candy companies overall, I mean, they, they were really the driver behind this. You ever hear the joke that, that, you know, Valentine's Day was created by the greeting card companies like Hallmark had a hand in it? Well, it is definitely true that the candy companies had a hand in pushing trick-or-treating because they saw a big boom in moneymaker in it. It exploded in the 50s after World War II when sugar rationing uh, went down and uh, the market's just gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. So, you know, in that frame that, uh, yeah, you could, you could blame it on the candy companies, but it's all in good fun. We've all had a great time with it. Um, it's always fun to dress up and uh, pretend to be somebody or something else. And, uh, you know, as for scary movies, they're not my thing. My wife loves them. I've got friends that love them. I don't really get it, but um, I'm not that kind of person that likes to be scared like that. And haunted houses have never been my thing, uh, which is kind of funny when the fact that I'm doing a haunted podcast. But I've always been obsessed with the um, idea of actual supernatural events versus the uh, the made up gore uh, pouring from the ceiling. So um, this is the end of this episode. Again, I want to thank you all for listening, and please like, uh, subscribe, and uh, donations are always appreciated. And one thing I'm trying to do differently is I want you to contact me with any criticisms. I also want you to contact me with feedback and any stories that you might have yourself. Uh, at contact me at uh, contact at a hauntedhistory.com. And what I'd like is if you would like to submit your own stories or stories from a friend or whoever, you know, I would be more than happy to feature your story on an episode and give you a shout out online because we're all in this together. Again, I thank you for listening. And I look forward to the next time.